Welcome to part two of episode one on the ProGrade podcast. This is recorded live on 23rd of September 2017. In part two, we will be discussing film, TV, and music. I am Dan, or my media handle is Aknesis Gaming. And back with me is Digital Psychosis, Matoru Ignika, and the Red Panda. Thanks, Lucy. Hello. Howdy. Wait, no. Hey, all. Oh, hi. Hey, all. <laughs> hey, all. Okay. All along. Does anyone particularly want to kick off this section? In fact, go on, Mater. What? You start. No, what? <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't volunteer for this. <laughs> you know what? You know what? I did the first one, so. Well, mine and, Red's, mine and Red's link in, so that's what I wanted if Mater wanted to get his done first. Okay, I'll take that as a no. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so in this one, the films I wanted to talk about, um, there's, a, there's a lot of good films that come out recently to um, Blu-ray, uh, which I've been buying. I bought Wonder Woman yesterday, but I only, I started watching Wonder Woman. Hey, 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 hey. Human slavery is illegal. You let her go. <laughs> what? That took a second. <laughs> that took me a second. <laughs> I wouldn't want to try. Ah. I wouldn't want to try and uh, restrain Wonder Woman. <laughs> but my kids love. Although, although, <laughs> oh. <laughs> yes, Digi's still here. So I, I tried to watch uh, Wonder Woman the other day. My kids love all the Batman, the um, uh, Avengers, you know, all the Marvel DC films. They love them, and uh, they were very excited for Wonder Woman, and we started watching it. And I hadn't watched it yet. I, hadn't, I didn't get to see it at the cinema, uh, and I just got inundated with question after question after question. My kids are the twins. They're five, um, so you can imagine. And they're girls, so you can imagine uh, the amount of questions that came my way. And then my wife started hoovering while I was watching Wonder Woman. So I just gave up, uh, turned it off, and walked away. So I will be re-watching that, and I'll probably talk about Wonder Woman next time. Uh, other films I want to talk about personally is Gardens of the Galaxy Volume 2. Oh. Don't don't spoil it. I still need to see it. Yeah, no. Oh, uh, you, just, you need to. Just a pre. You need to. That's just, oh. Just a preface uh, for the listeners here. Um, we <clears> will <throat> be keeping spoilers to an absolute minimum. My my aim in this uh, part, this segment, is not to spoil films for anyone. So there might be a few little bits and pieces that will drop in, but we're not gonna. The aim is not to spoil. <sighs> So just to if a film is clarify. over ten years old, though, maybe not so much. Well, maybe with this yeah, maybe we can put some um, <laughs> put some time limits on it. I'm I'm gonna break the flow. Loopy in the Loopy Dragon in chat has just said Lego Batman was legit the best Batman movie I've ever watched. I totally agree. I need to that buy this as well. I haven't seen it yet. It's amazing. So good. Uh, if you haven't seen Lego Batman. Do it! It's so funny! <laughs> well, I, I tried to get my parents around, because every now and again I get my parents over and we'll just have like a film night as a family, and uh, I suggested Lego Batman, and it didn't go down very well. I was like, but it's Lego Batman. It's it's just a kid's film as much as it is an adult's film, and most of them are these days. Yep. So, uh, yeah, I haven't seen Lego Batman yet. Uh, we'll buy it. We'll watch it. I'm very excited for that. There's a new Lego film coming but, out as well, isn't there? So... Ah, uh, yeah, Ninjago. <laughs> yeah, that's it. Um, yeah, so Gardens of the Galaxy and Wonder Woman I'll probably talk about next time. I know that, especially with these being monthly releases, so we'll, we'll get a film discussion episode release once a month. So a lot of this is going to be outdated. I'm going to apologise for that. But we'll, we'll still have some fun with it, and we'll definitely do some classic films. Uh, but the one I wanted to talk about today particularly, and this was... Um, this idea for this film came about from talking to Red on our practice and setup sessions we had the other weekend for this uh, pilot episode is the new Alien Covenant film. So again, as with the gaming, a lot of these films that we'll be talking about and TV and everything will be predominantly sci-fi and fantasy heavy um, because that's, that's what we all like collectively. But there will there'll definitely be other things as well. Uh, okay, Alien Covenant. Has anyone else watched Alien Covenant before I start going on about this? Never seen an Alien movie, so I'm out of this conversation. <gasps> really? Whoa! Big reveal. Mesa has not seen any um, Alien films. I'm shocked. I, I'm, I'm stunned. <laughs> that's, that's amazing. I don't know how you've missed this. That is actually amazing. Uh, did I open a can of worms? No. Yeah. Well, not to me. I just find it 
interesting that there's actually a movie I've seen that you haven't. So. Yeah, but Mason doesn't <laughs> like Star Wars. Well, I don't like Star Wars either. <gasps> Look, if you go back and objectively watch those films, they're not very good in retrospect. <laughs> Jeez, we, we've just Never lost about eighty percent of our followers now. <laughs> <laughs> the only Star series I care about is Stargate. Thank you very much. Well, yes, no, but I mean, high five, Mater. You've got taste. They were hell good at the time, yeah. but they didn't age well. Is what I'm saying. Particularly the the, the prequel trilogy. Let's not talk about the, the prequel, prequel trilogy. trilogy. That, well, that's a discussion on its own. Let's let's. I'm going to pull Look. you away from that tangent now. Which side is it? Is it that side? No, it's that side. Okay. Yeah. We'll get the They're trying to high-five each other yeah. to the uh, screen overlay. <laughs> yeah. I think okay. everybody's mad at what I just said about Star Wars so well. Yeah, I, I would have kept that a secret, Red. I would have taken that to your grave. Can you bleep that out for me? I, I can edit that. I don't know. I think it... No, I'll let it out. Otherwise, people will turn off our podcast on the, on the yeah. platform release. So, back to point. Mater has somehow avoided the Alien franchise. Mm-hmm. This is. Have you even seen Alien vs. Predator? I have not. Have you even seen Predator? I have not. Ooh. Oh. I thought you liked sci-fi movies. So oh. get all the chopper. You, you, I'm not get through the movie chopper. Person. That was immediately my thought. <laughs> Come on, kill me so right people... here. <laughs> Come on, do it. So when people say those things, do you, do you it don't. Now. Know... <laughs> no. Wow. No clue. Okay. <sighs> I just know they're a thing. Yes, there are. <sighs> I don't blame them. I mean, people see things. I think uh, this section should just predominantly be ruled by uh, digital psychosis and myself. I think we're going to get a lot of hate mail already. <laughs> Jack's gone yeah. very quiet. <laughs> I'll, I'll take the hate mail. I'll take the hate mail because it just... Please, if anybody's I... getting hate mail here, it's me because I haven't seen these things. No, but I just said I didn't like... One of the best loved series of like. Okay, ever. we're getting the hate mail because yeah. I don't care for it either. All right, okay. Look, All right. Predator, Predator. Look, it's a real tragedy that they never made a sequel. That's all I'll say. Wait, didn't they make like ten sequels? They never made a sequel, Red. Pretty sure they did. They never made a sequel. Wasn't it like Predator Takes Manhattan? They and... never <laughs> made a sequel. <laughs> I could have sworn there were some <laughs> Reds. Hey, <I> never <laughs> look at Digi's eyes. Made a sequel to Predator, <laughs> and it's such a shame. <laughs> <laughs> I think that... it's like the Matrix. It's a real shame they never made a sequel to the Matrix. Is it? Is it a shame they like they never made an uh, a real a live action Avatar film? <laughs> I know! They could have done so well making a live-action Avatar film. It's just such a shame they never made it. Mm. Aang would have been so good as a non-animated character. Your DVD... Of the appropriate racial descent. Uh, correct, yes. No whitewashing here. <laughs> Digi, your, your DVD collection, I imagine, is very specific. It may be. <laughs> You know, when you buy the entire Alien and Predator collection and uh, you know, certain, dis <laughs> certain discs just get thrown out, they just disappear. So let me guess, Alien, Aliens, Alien vs. Predator, stopped. Full stop. And, and Predator, and that's it. And Predator, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> there you go, that's, that's me. How about Predators? Oh! The one on their planet thingy? No, we're definitely not going. To Don't alien. know what you're talking about. No, I actually kind of like that one. Okay, never mind. Anyway, it's like it's like it's like. Look, <laughs> where has this section gone? <laughs> it's like Star Wars, you know, with with Star Wars, you know, oh, it's a real shame they never did a Christmas special. Oh, the Christmas it's a like shame that. they oh. never did more with the Ewoks. Oh, yeah, that Ewok one with the little. They, they never did enough with the Ewoks, I feel. You know, and, they could have done so much, maybe just <laughs> some form of Christmas special. It would have been great. Or even a, um, a, a, a Sesame Street special. It's a shame they didn't do that oh, as well, wasn't oh. it? 
They did a Sesame oh, no. Street special? I didn't know that one. No, they didn't do a Sesame Street. Actually, the, the Sesame Street special is actually golden compared to a Christmas special they didn't make. Yeah. <laughs> they may oh. or may not have made. <laughs> if you want to see Mark Hamill in makeup, wow. <laughs> okay. It's terrible. Isn't he in makeup and everything that he does? Oh, no, 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 no. No, not compared to a Christmas special that they didn't make with the, <laughs> with the, with the <laughs> Wookiees. <laughs> <laughs> Christmas I'm, Wookies. I'm gonna oh, use it. I'm gonna I use it. We had it to use play. It. It's I fucking don't. terrible. <laughs> <laughs> Christmas Wookies. If you if you have you if you have not seen the Christmas special, I'm gonna acknowledge its existence because you do need to go and see the Star Wars Christmas special. That's all I'm gonna say. It's 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 tragedy on film. It's really is. Dane comes in. It's amazing. <laughs> uh, anyway, Dane, anyway, get out. Anyway, Alien Covenant. Alien Covenant. Let's turn it all back around. Uh, Alien Covenant. We're yes. so off track. Yes. Well, yeah. we have Alien Covenant. <laughs> kind of. There is a plan here. I've got two plans in front of me. So, Alien Covenant. I rewatched it again last night. Alien Covenant is the second film following Prometheus, which in itself is a prequel to the Alien film. So it's how it's how they got to Alien. Uh, Prometheus. Uh, I I'm on the minority here. I enjoyed Prometheus. And you did? Yeah, I did. I enjoyed Prometheus. I'm going to say it again. We're wow. going to lose another twenty percent of our following, but I did enjoy Prometheus. Um, where where look, people honestly, run but, can't run out of the way and no, I where... went. I think the big difference. I went in expecting, and again, we'll do a little spoiler alert here. But I went in expecting not to see aliens. So That's not the issue. The issue is that that people All you gotta do is like, run sideways. Or notice that somebody's putting stuff in your glass or Well, that's 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 actually um Alien Covenant. So because there was such a backlash from Prometheus, um and Ridley Scott's decided to take Alien Covenant in a completely different direction, so um, again, just I'll emphasize loose spoilers, um, not nothing uh, that's going to ruin the film for you. I'm, I'm not going to mention anything that's going to ruin the film here if you haven't seen it. But Michael Fassbender's character, we, he plays the android, so Bishop's role, um, but in these prequels, he plays the android. And after watching Alien Covenant, I'm actually much more intrigued by Michael Fazbender's characters of he plays the androids David and Walter. He carries the film. If you remove Michael Fassbender from Prometheus and Alien Covenant, especially, uh, I think you'd have a very different film. He carries the films, and he in himself is so intriguing and plays the part so well that you almost forget it's an alien film or set in the alien universe anyway. So, yeah, going back to the original question, has anyone seen Alien Covenant? I know Mater hasn't. We've established that. No, negative. No. Hi. But have anyone seen Prometheus? Yes. Negative. Yeah, okay, so uh, Red's in Prometheus. So, yeah, um, Gajira's coming. Prometheus is fine if you didn't go to see an Aliens flick. And I think that's what a lot of people are disappointed with. People go to watch Aliens films to see Aliens. This is a prequel of Alien. But it was, uh, in all fairness to Ridley Scott, he did emphasize that this film isn't about Aliens. It's about the story leading up to it. But I think the backlash was so strong after Prometheus that for Alien Covenant, they had to put in some Aliens. And they they did put in some aliens. We're seeing the alien um, evolve in its creation from the weird serpent things that you saw in Prometheus up to what you recognize as a, a typical alien today from the franchise. And it's how the alien got from Prometheus, the snake thing, to what you would see in Alien, the first film. Uh, but like I say, uh, Michael Fassbender has such a... Um, such an intriguing and well-played role in this, and it's also well-scripted, that the film almost becomes about him. And you're more intrigued about him, well, for me personally, anyway, I was more intrigued about David and Walter, especially David, than I was uh, the alien itself. And the alien just sort of ends up just being there rather than um, being the focus of the film. 
So, and I'm disappointed you haven't watched this actually, did you? Because there's a reference that uh, I'm going to make, which you now have to watch the film. You have to watch Alien Covenant. In Alien Covenant, there is the best fluting since Picard in the Next Generation. Ah. Uh, and I'm just going to leave. Not sure it there. how I feel about that. It's a big, big call. You, you're really going to lean into that one? Yeah. You, you, when you see it, you'll know exactly what I mean. Um, the best right. fluting. Uh, and the best we'll go fluting. as far to say homoerotica <laughs> as well with it. So it's like well, hard fluting 3.0. We're just skipping the 2.0. Going straight to 3. Fluting and homoerotica, you've got me. Yeah, there we go. So sold it to Digi. So if you want to know what I'm on about, go and see Alien I Covenant. Am checking out the building. <laughs> <laughs> So um, in the other film, of course, we've got Michael Fassbender. Uh, he's the only character that carried over from Prometheus. There is, um, well, Guy Pearce's character is in there as well, but a much younger version. The film starts um, with David's, um, you'd almost, I, I, I'm pretty certain that this is the moment that David first is activated as an android. Uh, that's what it seems anyway. And you start the film with Guy Pearce and Michael Fassbender there. And... Um, you get an understanding of where Dave is coming from. In Prometheus, the film or the origin of aliens looked like it was going to come from the people they call the engineers, which are the tall white uh, giants. So, uh, again, I'm not going to get into too many details, but because of the way that it looked like Prometheus was heading <coughs> in terms of its story arc for the following films, Ridley Scott changed it. Um, and the change, so the engineers are no longer the focus you're looking at something else and the change I think works exceptionally well. It, it works exceptionally well. I'm pleased with this new direction. It does kind of make the engineers mostly redundant now uh, for the alien origins and the creations. Um, it still has a lot of relevance in uh, Prometheus. So alien covenant, it could have the, the direction they've taken it. It could have endangered Prometheus as being irrelevant. It has in some cases, I think, but in a lot of in a lot of ways, um, it will change the way you look at Prometheus as a film. So, like will my old man, make me think. Will it make me think the people in Prometheus aren't brain damaged? Um, you will care less about the people in Alien Covenant. They don't do. But any... I mean, the people in Pro you still make me think differently about the people in Alien Prometheus. And my question is. Will it make me think that these scientists are acting completely out of character merely to advance the plot? <laughs> or, <laughs> because... irras or irrational. They are cannon fodder. There's no getting away from that. It wouldn't be an they, alien they... film if there wasn't cannon fodder. Um... Okay, there's cannon fodder, and then there's acting specifically stupid enough to advance the plot because you can't make them do intelligent things and continue to advance the plot. You can actually have your characters act intelligently... And still advance the plot. You don't have to make your characters have the collective IQ of a sponge. Of a sponge. <laughs> Fine. Would that be SpongeBob SquarePants? <laughs> I mean. <laughs> oh. I can't hear using, you. Using a med bay C section to remove an alien. But that was the most intense part of the film. Running sideways. Re refusing to run sideways when something's about to fall on top of you. Getting lost when you're the guys who had the mapping software. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to, I'm not saying that oh, there's no Oh wait, plot didn't holes we yet. have those cubes that we sent out to map this whole place and weren't we in charge of that? I really wish I remembered how to find my way out. <laughs> <laughs> A good year has discovered the mistake Scott makes over and over is trying to explain the aliens. That's removed the mystery, and now they're just funny looking orcs in yet another Middle Earth sci fi special. So, I mean, I. I yeah, no, I, you do get the stupid thing. So, you will get someone who's going to go, hey, I'm going to go for a cigarette break. And then he'll, and he'll wander off, and you think, ah, well, he's about to get it. And he does. That, so, I can accept that. Hey, that android who's been out there with the aliens just stuck his finger in my glass of water, and now there looks like there's something in it. He I'll didn't drink see that. that. He didn't see it. <laughs> he did it right in front of him. If you watch the scene, he's looking at the glass when the guy does it. Oh, I don't know. I have to rewatch that. 
But um, I mean, it's like I, I, I'm like, oh, this is why I didn't go watch Covenant. It's because. You know, it, it, it rage. There were <laughs> rage panda. It, ah, I mean, I, I'm okay Look, really, with really people having to be movie stupid, right? I understand that movie stupid is a thing, but there's movie stupid and there's so stupid I'm surprised they were able to climb the ladder to get into the ship. Well, <laughs> let me let me pitch it a different way. If you go and see an alien film, you pretty much want to go and see people die in horrible ways. You want to see the aliens, and they, and you no, get, actually, you get if that I in- go see an alien film, I want to go watch um, what's her name, flame aliens, and blow them up. But that's okay. Sigourney <laughs> Weaver. Yes, really? I want to see Sigourney <laughs> Weaver. Be Stay away alien from her, up. you bitch. Yeah, that's why I go to see alien films. <laughs> so yeah, you, you get the you get the people that are cannon fodder. You get a lot of characters that are just there to die in horrible ways. And Covenant, you will see people die in horrible ways in Covenant. Uh, yeah, there is some there is some weird things that happen that aren't quite even law. I will say, uh, for instance, watching the alien grow in front of your eyes very very quickly. <laughs> I know they grew quick anyway in previous films, but uh, they just grow ridiculously quick. And normally, when someone gets um, face hugged and uh, implanted with the embryo, the alien embryo, there's normally a bit of a wait between the alien being implanted and actually bursting out of the chest right. or the back in one of the instances, which is not a spoiler because it's in the previews. So, um, yeah, in Covenant, that is a very short time frame. The aliens seem to have suddenly accelerated growth. And, yeah, who knows? Maybe that will uh, develop a bit later on. Um, but you do get to see people die in horrible ways if that's what you like. And if you're going to watch alien films, uh, this is more... Um, Alien 2, not to compare them to Alien 1 or Alien 2, but this is more Aliens because there's a lot of action. There's a lot of action. There's a lot of beautiful beautiful scenes. There is the suspense. I mean, Alien, the first film, was just about suspense, the anticipation. It was, it was, it was, it was painful, but you had to watch it. Um, yeah, th- there well, is. Kujira makes the, makes the exact point about that. Alien is horror, whereas Aliens is action. Which, yes, yep. yeah. They're totally different they are, films. And they both work. And they both work. Yeah. And, yeah. And yeah, I've just seen it in that Gajira. Well, Alien and Aliens are two different genres, both good, but very much chalk and cheese. Yeah. So in terms of the genre stuff, the um, uh, Covenant is more towards Aliens. Um, not as much action. Um, there's still the suspense there and there's still action there. Um, and there's a lot of gruesome deaths if you're into that sort of thing. And there's no storyline or backstory with these characters. You don't really care for them that much. The only way you care for them or that give the characters weight in their emotions is the, the Covenant, which is the name of the ship. It's a colony ship, and the crew of that colony ship are all married couples, which is a bit silly in itself, but that's what it is. So when the spouses of individuals start dying then that gives the, the widowed spouse a, a much stronger emotion um, and makes them start doing some crazy things that they wouldn't have if, if, if there was, wasn't that broken connection of relationship. So, but that's as much as you get in terms of emotional weight behind the characters. You do get a bit of backstory uh, from Danny, which is uh, Catherine Waterson as Janet Danny Daniels, who's the main heroine. Um, you do get a bit of backstory with her. James Franco's shortest appearance in a film, probably. Uh, it wasn't barely a cameo. Uh, but James Franco is in the film. He's at the beginning, um, and he doesn't last long. But there is a bit of... You get a bit of backstory between James Franco, um, who's the captain of the Covenant, and uh, Janet Daniels, or Danny, which is Catherine Watson character. Uh, but as far as that, there isn't really any character backstory. So you don't care for these characters. You do end up just waiting for them to say that stupid thing was, hey, I'm just going to go over here on my own. Uh, No need to follow. Yes, I will be back soon. Um, Catch you later. And then from that, you go, okay, you're just waiting for that person to get got by uh, by an alien. Um, And you do do see a good uh, development of the alien itself as well. And like I say, but... This film is about Michael. It's not about Michael Fassbender, but he steals the show and for very good reasons in a very good way. Uh, like I said at the beginning, his character, you just get totally engrossed into his character in the film. And at points you even forget about the aliens themselves because Michael Fassbender is just so intriguing in his characters. Uh, and he's, it's played, it's, he plays beautifully. Um, 
there's nothing wrong with any other performances. It's just, you know, the scripting can be a bit stupid in places, uh, as, as Red was. Um, I think the key to. difference behind these prequels and the the Alien series, like the first three films, you know, the the fourth one I don't even acknowledge exists. The first three, because while Alien 3 was the weaker of the three, I still think it was okay the the difference is you always wanted to see ripley survive you wanted to see her survive and move on to the next film how she does it how she does it how it all happens how it plays out it's a survival thing for her and we want to see her survive with this we know that everyone's doomed from the start because it's a prequel they are uh, these these aliens are killing machines. Uh, they exist to kill. So these people are doomed from the beginning. That's the long and short of it. And it's like, well, there's no intrigue. If they're going to die, they're going to die. They're all dead anyway. So when the stupid thing happens, you just go, oh, well, all right. Cool, move on to the next. I suppose so, you could say that with Rogue One as well. Rogue One suffered for lack of character backstory. But as you made the point that they're going to die, you know they're going to die anyway. So what's yeah. the point in investing in these characters? But I think the difference is that Rogue One had a purpose. It had a very direct purpose of a two meter wide plot hole that they had to fill. Yeah. Right? <laughs> no bigger than a womp rat. Uh, that they had to fill that plot hole and explain away that one particular issue. Whereas this is trying to explain history, long years and years and years of history. But Rogue One falls just before the very first film. Yeah, it's, you could almost stitch them together. Correct. Mm. And and if you've done that, it's fantastic. I've, I've done it. It's great. <laughs> so, okay, Alien Covenant. We'll leave that alone there. Uh, I, I do recommend watching Alien Covenant if you're um, a, uh, a fan of the franchise. Uh, I will heed the warning that a lot of people have been disappointed by the film. The film took a very different direction for what Prometheus, Prometheus was setting it up for. And we're going to expect a lot more of these films as well. Uh, Alien 5 stopped development in favour of making um, Alien Covenant. Uh, and Ridley Scott, have you ever seen Ridley Scott in an interview? Wow. No. So um, he's, a, he's an interesting bloke. So uh, he's, he alluded that he's going to make a lot of these prequels. Or a lot, we well, didn't, was it a lot of these films or a lot of these prequels? We're obviously going to get at least one more prequel uh, between um, Covenant and Alien. And uh, the Alien franchise, he's going to be keeping it alive for some time. So there's a lot more Alien films to come. Whether there will be any more prequels than one more, I don't know. But we'll just have to wait and see on that. So Alien Covenant, I do recommend it. Uh, it's not the best Alien film, but it's certainly not the worst. And uh, you just watch it for Michael Fassbender's performance. Um, he, he, just, he does a blinding job, and it's worth go and see it for him and in terms of the aliens you get to see a bit of alien evolution but the alien itself at the end is the alien that we all recognize from the other films uh, you get to see it in full light yes it is all cgi now it's not people in costumes um so it's very scatty in its movements uh, and aggressive in its movements which you couldn't obviously replicate with a person in a costume uh, but you get to see it in full light it's no the aliens are no longer hidden in dark and because um, a lot of the like alien aliens a lot of it was this the the, the, the tents and um, the suspense of not seeing these things or only partially seeing these things. If you want to see an alien in all its glory, then you get to see that in Alien Covenant. Okay. Um, do you want to talk about your jump scare stuff, Red? As we're, uh, or do you feel you've ranted well, see, enough? No, I mean, okay. So this, the, this our is podcast, one of my bugbears our, about films as well. Our podcast, I assume this will be released before Halloween or at least in October at some point is my hope. Yes, and so be. I thought that this was a good time to talk about this. And I thought I would uh, just briefly mention my personal favorite horror films, um, which many people who know me from my streams and such might go, wait, you've got a personal horror film you like? Because I <laughs> tend not to be into that kind of thing. 
uh, from most people's perspective. But this is um, Silent Hill. <coughs> Silent Hill. The movie, the movie Silent Hill and the sequel, I believe it's Silent Hill Redemption or something like that. I gotta look that up real quick. I'm sorry. Isn't that isn't that the one with um, with uh, yeah, Revelation, Silent Hill Revelation, Silent Hill Redemption, Silent Hill? Isn't that the one with um, Sean Bean in it? Where of course he dies because that's what Sean Bean does in every movie. Oh, stop it! <laughs> I love Sean Bean. I mean, Revel- he's great. Revelation. He died yeah. this <laughs> Silent Hill Revelation. It was in, It came out in 2012. It was the sequel. And, uh, yeah, Sean Bean is in it. Yeah. Yeah. Yep, yep, I Sean quite Bean's enjoyed that. I, um, I've seen that one. But, yeah, I haven't seen the first one. I've seen that one. Uh, it's not bad. Well, what's interesting about that one is in the opening sequence, they give you a bit of a jump scare and a... Um, a... a, a Oh man, you can tell it's late late for me and I can't think straight because I've been thinking too much. Um when they allude to something that's um pre something's coming up, they 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 allude to it. It's um they preemptively No, not preemptively, but um I don't know. Suspense. Anyway, they they, they hint at what they they they, they they do a scene in a dream and then you see the li- the literal exact same scene later and during the dream sequence the first time there's a jump scare and foreshadowing there we go and when you get to the actual scene that's not in the dream there's no jump scare it's the reverse they they mm. took the jump scare out so you're surprised mm. because the jump scare's not there and this goes in beautifully to my rant on jump scares not being scary um so I like these films because they're suspense. There's a story to them. They 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 play around a lot with things. Um, yeah, there's some gore. Yeah, there's some some scary things. Yeah, there are some quote unquote jump scares, but they don't rely on it. It seems to me that the modern horror film relies on jump scares. Yeah, and what this amounts to is playing a very loud sound, flashing light in a otherwise darkened theater. To create a startle reflex, which is what it is. It's a startle reflex. It's an autonomic response of your nervous system. If you are not deaf and I come up next to you and play a very loud sudden sound in your ear without warning you, you're going to be startled. There are certain things that your body will do. Your blood pressure will rise. Your your heart rate will increase. Your, you know, your, your blood vessels will contract. You'll get a shot of adrenaline. That's not scary. That's taking advantage of the fact that we grew up in a, you know, grew up meaning evolved in a situation where it was good to jump and run when something like that happened. Yeah, fight or flight, <laughs> yeah. isn't it? Fight or flight. It's responses. fight or flight. It's, it's startle reflexes. And too many modern films rely on the startle reflex and, and say, oh, it's the scariest film ever. No, that's not scary. That's cheating. That's using an autonomic nervous system response to create a fake scare, a cheap scare, and it is the ultimate um, fallback of people who can't write scary things. It's... It's become a movie trope that's that's well overplayed nowadays. Yeah. There is a point that um, that was just made by Emerald in the chat. Watch Korean or Japanese ones and you'll be taught otherwise. Japanese horror is so very different to Western horror. I can definitely agree with that. If you look at The Ring, both versions of The Ring, the Japanese and the US version, so totally different and it, it works really well. But it's a massive trope that that is very highly overplayed nowadays, and I think that we're starting to see that a lot. I just can't with be bothered the with rem- it. I can't be bothered. Well, exactly. With waiting, for exactly. The- I know it's coming. I was like, oh, just get on. With true, it. true horror. True horror really comes from the existential dread of a film, right? Uh, and and the same can be said for games as well. And 
jump scares while they're all all well and good. Using Outlast as an example, right? Yes, there were jump scares in that, but the dread, the constant dread, is what freaked me out the most. Dread, right? Yeah, that's a good word to use. Yeah, it's what... and that is those are the two things that are really major in the formula. One is the shock factor, and the other is the dread. And the dread needs to be stronger. If you take a look at the remake of Stephen King's It, that the, now the, everyone's talking about it because yeah. it's been released, and the common consensus is they've done away with the jump scares. It's just dread. Constant dread. And I want to say something here from chat. So uh, I'll go back. I'll, I'll do the recent chat first from All Shane. Uh, by the time you leave the theatre, you've forgotten the jump scare, but real horror sits in your brain long after the film. Yes, Absolutely. and Gojira Absolutely. said a little bit earlier, I like disturbing horror movies, Event Horizon being a good one. I That's still, fabulous. I still feel dread from the film Event Horizon, and I haven't watched it probably in over 10 years. But so that much. is one that There's sticks a... in my mind. If you guys haven't played the Soma video game, when you want to talk about jump scares and dread and psychological twisting, that has some jump scares in it, but it makes you think because it's all about what makes up consciousness and what you are and getting left behind and and the horror of, you know, if I made a copy of myself and my copy went on, but I'm still here and I'm being tortured, you know, does that really count? It's, yep. uh, it, it is... You can do it, and movies do it. And part of the reason I like the two Silent Hill films is the duality that they try to play at, the themes they play at. And what's really interesting is it most video game movies don't turn out well. And Silent Hill was a movie based on a video game, and it turned out well. I thought it was phenomenal. So, um, so you know, I think that... You know, in honor of Halloween, I wanted to come out and say, you know, what my favorite horror films were. And I wanted to say that, you know, jump scares have their place. I'm not saying that that there should never be a jump scare. But if the predominant horror effect that you use in your horror movie is a jump scare, a la what were all these um, recent ones the with the, the kids and the 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 haunted houses and stuff um with the found footage stuff which by the way is also way overdone um Blair Witch stuff yeah but no the, the, there's been like seven of these stupid ones that have come out like the with the paranormal doll. activity yeah paranormal oh. activity and stuff mm-hmm. like that um they and and found footage i'm sorry found footage can be okay <laughs> but get yourself a steady cam Invest a few bucks. Get yourself a steady cam. Shaking the camera is not an excuse for drama or suspense. It's an excuse to make me nauseous and want to throw up. It's look. It, we're it's, we're uh, we're documentary makers. You know, we're we're really really good, but um, we hold our camera like this exactly yeah, to right. make our documentary. SDG shakes his it's hands. Lady, I mean, lazy filmmaking, and a good one as well that I hate is uh, they did it in the early Bourne films um, where yes. they zoom in on the action, and you have no. And they did it on some of the Transformers. Or cuts. Well, yeah, you cannot see what the hell is going on. You just got blur all over this. You know they're fighting, but you just can't see what's going on. Was, there was it was there one was of the a movie reasons I, that I think John Wick is night. a fantastic um, film. There was a movie I was watching last night, and I cannot, for the name of, for the life of me, remember the name of it. It was that non-memorable, but it was a modern action film, and there was a fight sequence, and in the period of about three seconds, there were about 20 cuts in the fighting, uh. and it's like you literally can't let someone throw a single punch without doing a cut. Mm. I had to see this punch from five different angles as it moved forward. And what is it? It's, I mean, I couldn't even tell what was going on. So you, you, you do so many cuts that I can't tell what's going on or you make it look like something it isn't because you're lazy and can't do it real. Or you jiggle the camera around to get over the fact that you don't have anyone who can do it right and can't afford the special effects. John Wick... I did it right. Yes. Long sequences, not many cuts, um, and not not a, not a lot of shaky cam. 
You know, I can understand if you're running and doing a first person perspective, fine. But if you're in a nightclub rave situation and there's a fight going on, there's already lights flashing. There's already darkness. There's already don't shake the camera on me. I might as well just, you know, go make a cup of tea. Exactly. (laughs) So sequence finishes. So, so you know, it, it, movie makers need to to stop thinking they're being too clever by half when they do that kind of stuff. Oh, it's lazy. And it's lazy. It's lazy. Jump cuts are lazy. Um, shaky cam is lazy, and and too many cuts Close in ups. in one sequence jump are scares. are. I think yep. jump scares should just be there to enhance the shock, not to be the shock. Yes. So. That's that's the way they should be, that's what without a doubt. Be. That's the purpose. Okay. Anyway, I wanted to get in because that was my Halloween thing. Because I figured this podcast would be released in October, and you know, if someone wants to go watch some some, beware, they are rated R films. I think uh, they should be if they're not. Um, Pretty sure Silent they Hill are. And Silent Hill uh, Redemption. I mean, it's it's uh, Revelation. I guess it, they're they're good films, um, but they're you know, they're scary. Mm. So, that's why they're my favorite horror films. Hey, King of Hearts. All right, we'll move on then. Um, I've just got a couple of things to mention, and then... I uh, think Mater's fallen asleep. Yeah. Should we give no. him a chance? <laughs> I don't know, I'm not there. a horror film guy, so I have nothing to add to this. Yeah. Okay. I, d- I, don't, do, I don't do horror films either, Mater. It's okay. I, generally I typically don't, don't <laughs> either, but that's why I was... <laughs> that was the whole point. Yeah. Don't worry, did you? We have our phone and our figure painting <laughs> let's go to tv then shall we <laughs> well hang on i just got a couple of things to mention which could segue into something later might want to talk about um okay. so i got some new like the han solo the upcoming han solo film the spin-off for star wars uh don't watch star wars you don't watch star wars i know so it's going to breeze over this quickly it's old news anyway now really uh but for those that might be interested the directors phil lord and chris miller got fired from um or let go from the directing of the new han solo film uh it was, it's due for release in May 2018. Directors were fired after disagreements with the producer who didn't feel their take was Star Wars enough. So uh, the reason that, uh, the speculation is that Phil Lord and Chris Miller do a lot of comedy films, and then they did, and then they were put on Han Solo film, which is Star Wars. So Han Solo is a sarcastic character. I, don't think, I wouldn't say he's a funny character. Um, he's sarcastic by nature. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so yep. um, and they veered too much from the script as well. The directors veered too much from the script and added extra comedy that didn't fit with both Star Wars and the Han Solo character. So they clashed with the producer, um, who's the Luke, uh, Lucasfilm chief, Kathleen Kennedy, and the co-writer, executive producer, which is Lawrence Kasdan. Ron Howard has now stepped in. So this makes me happy, actually. Ron Howard has stepped in to uh, finish the Star Wars um, Han Solo spinoff. They've done a lot of reshoots uh, they've had to cut some <laughs> characters because they weren't available for the reshoots because they were working on other projects uh, but ron howard is now the director and um I- i've got confidence in ron howard i like ron howard as a director uh the best standout film for me is apollo 13 i'm sure we'll talk about that at some point as well um he just he, he gets it he, he gets he gets he gets film he, he gets film he gets it. He doesn't try and um, steer off. He knows that he gets the tone of the film, the nature of the film, what it's supposed to be, and he'll do it. So I'm pleased that Ron Howard stepped in. Um, uh, Paul Bettany, who's the Vision from the Avengers, among other things, uh, was brought into the film as well. So yeah, it'll be good to see Paul Bettany in there. And other news on the Star Wars front, an Obi-Wan Kenobi spin-off is in talks. And Ewan McGregor is excited about reprising his uh, character of... Um, Obi-Wan God, Kenobi. I hope he does. Yeah, I do. I hope he does. He said he feels like he's the right age. He's in between because um, he's yeah, well, he's forty-five he's... now. So he'll be yeah. a stepping stone between his young Kenobi and Alec Guinness's Kenobi. So um, yeah. hopefully that will happen. Uh, Star Trek, Star Trek Discovery launches today, the twenty-fourth of September, on CBS All Access. It's the twenty-third. Get with the program. Twenty-fourth over here, dude. Um, and the only there's we're a, ahead uh, of you. If, if if you even know Star Trek slightly, you'll know that all the kerfuffle that's gone on with uh, Star Trek Discovery. But the early previews, so people have been now allowed to see the first two episodes of Star Trek Discovery, and the reviews are extremely positive. Um, 
they say there's loads of action and backstory, and it definitely feels like Star Trek. For those that are worried, hopefully they'll offer some peace of mind. Um, I'm ignoring everything. As a massive Trekkie, I am ignoring everything. Pretending that no reviews exist. I don't want to know what happens. Form your own I'm going to go in blind. Yeah. Isn't this based in the new rebooted universe? No. No. It's the, it it's the like standard it. timeline. It's the standard timeline, but it's prior to um, the original series. So it actually fits in between. There are components. They've, they've said that there is going to be aspects of the outside timelines, but they're not going to be a primary focus. After the whole Warp 5, uh, what's from a call it guy? It's between um, Enterprise uh, and... Enterprise. Yeah. And Archer and Kirk. It's between Archer and Kirk. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Before Kirk, after Archer. Okay. Yeah. Uh, that, that's me done with um, film and TV. So... Have any of you seen Orville? All right. No, just going to say, it hasn't come out in Australia yet. Do not say anything. Do not say a damn word because I need to get a hold of it. They're not releasing it here for quite some time, so I need to find a way to get it. I, I, I had words to say and things. You're, you're welcome to say it. You're yeah. welcome to say it. I'm, I'm interested to see uh, hear about this because again, the, I, the reviews. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna spoil anything. I promise. I'm not gonna talk <laughs> about the plots. Red, it's okay. I was speaking for dramatic effect. <laughs> what? What? It has the potential to be a great series. It really does. The problem is that Seth doesn't know what he wants to do with it. Either, well, yeah. either it needs to be a comedy or it needs to be a, a drama. And he can't seem to figure out which he wants. Because he touches on some very mature content and a lot of the jokes feel like they're just shoehorned in because he's Seth and he needs jokes. And, I mean, one of my favorite parts in the first series, though, in the first the pilot episode, and this is not spoiling anything too much, I think, is when one of the deck crew has to go, runs into someone else on his way to the bathroom mid-shift. And it's like, you never saw that in Star Trek. Nah, <laughs> you never saw, nah. you know, the deck crew going, oh, I'm going to go get a coffee and, you know, hey, can we have soda on the bridge? <laughs> the last captain let us have soda on the bridge if we kept it below. Oh, yeah, if you keep it below the console, you can have it. <laughs> uh, that's great. I yeah. mean, it's like, it's like, it's a real job, you know, it's like, you know, they're not this... I can relate. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So. So I think it has this potential to be this really great thing, but he has to find his stride. He has to figure out where he's going with it. And I worry that Fox is, feels like they're already playing games on what time slot it's here. And that's the death of the series. (laughs) I think, I think the big thing with Seth MacFarlane is that, well, there's, there's two big things. The first being is, one, he's been in Star Trek a few times. Like, there were, there were quite a few episodes of Enterprise. He was actually a crew member. All right. Full speaking roles, everything. Like, he, he gets Trek. He completely gets Trek. The second point is that he's made his money on comedy. So I think what you said about shoehorning in the comedy is something that he needs to do to get the audience to start with, and then he can build in the solid sci-fi. Do you think that's because people expect the comedy from him? No, that's right. When I say shoehorning in comedy, I mean there's some really good comedy elements in the show that don't feel shoehorned in, and then there are jokes that feel like they were added on top of the already funny things that they were doing just because he felt he needed a joke at that particular moment. And <laughs> there, there have been so, th- I, already I watched it's on Thursdays here and I watched last Thursday and I'm a fan. I'm hearing yeah, great but things I'm worried about what, it. I'm hearing but I'm things. worried about what Fox will do. And I, and I'm worried about where the series is going to go and all of that. And I'm afraid it doesn't have, I'm afraid if the ratings aren't good enough, it's not going to be given enough of a chance to get the ratings that it probably could get. <laughs> Firefly. 
Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's already been mentioned in chat by Loopy. Yeah, so... And Emerald. <clears throat> but yeah, I, I, the critically, it didn't look like it did too well, but from the general reviews, it seems to be um, a favorite already. So I'm looking forward well, to so it. Well, so far, the worst episode for me was the first. So it's, uh, <laughs> <laughs> so it's gotten better since the first one. So hey, I well, had this... our first episode, we're not too bad. Yeah, <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Well, let's see. Just two and a half hours late, you know. It's <laughs> yeah, fine. you know, no big deal. <laughs> no big deal. We're total anyway, professionals. We're I, professional. If Fox right. gives it his chance and Seth gets his stride in the writings, I think it'll be a great series. They've already, but they've got to learn that there's certain kind of humor that they shouldn't be trying to shoehorn into it. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah, they'll find their stride. Um. Okay, moving on to television. I know this is television. That was television. Okay, I'll edit that out. The, that okay. it, that, that, <laughs> it's just because I'm following my, my thing. Delete um, everything. Delete everything but my, until this point. But the Orville was a pretty good lead-in from what you had said, so I figured I'd cover my two yes. cents. I, yeah. I didn't give away any of the plots or anything, but I do recommend that you at least give it a try yeah, and to see it. how it goes. Um, the other thing is The Expanse. I know Digi's got something to say on this. I started watching The Expanse, but dropped off because um, I just focused on other things. So uh, The Expanse is a, a TV, futuristic TV series based in our solar system, and I'm thinking about getting back into that. So I will, and uh, I'll report back on that as well. But The Expanse is another sci-fi. Did you? The only, the only thing that I will say about it is, um, look, I'm not a reader, and it's pretty much driven me to want to read the books because okay. it is... It is that good. The second season knocks it out of the park. Um, the end of the season, you know, we know every every TV show at the end of the season, it ends with cliffhanger. This ends with several. And the fact that there are multiple characters following multiple different plot lines, and this is get, just getting so complex is really intriguing. You know it's all going to come together and it's all going to come to a head, but there has been so much going on throughout this season that it's absolutely wild. And that end of season series of cliffhangers is spectacular. So if you haven't watched The Expanse, I highly recommend it. It's one that I was very, very excited to see. There was a season two dropping. It was great. And Conquer Owners just said, said exactly what you said. I'm actually going to read through the books because of how good it was. So it's a sci-fi. Oh, Conquer Owners. Uh, see, that's, that's my feeling completely. I, I, cannot, I cannot sing its praises enough. I don't hear much about it, though. I don't hear much it's, about it. Maybe uh, I'm not looking hard enough. but um, I'm, I'm pretty sure it's a Netflix-only show. Yeah. But it's but it's full sci-fi. Like it is it is a proper sci-fi show with no extra padding. It is hard sci-fi. Mm. Yeah, it is good. I'm going to get back into that and report back next time. Has anyone else got anything to say about film and TV? Um, the Defenders. It was kind of all right. You were talking about jump cuts before, and all I felt like saying was, oh my god, that's the Defenders. That's everything that features Iron Fist, because Iron Fist is nothing but jump cuts. <laughs> um, and seriously, if Iron Fist tells me that he is the immortal Iron Fist from Kun Lun, one more time, I'm going to break his freaking neck. Ah, uh, now Because he says it like ten questions. times an episode. <laughs> Ten times a goddamn episode. Just, dude, stop. Stop. You are the immortal Iron Fist, enemy of the hand. You are defender of Kunlun. I get it. Stop. You don't? That got well overplayed. But i got to say, <laughs> Madam Gao, fantastic. She's still great. She was really spectacular. And I don't think we've seen the last of her. Mm. Okay. There you go. Okay, yeah, you've got some good responses in chat from there as well. But uh, we'll, we'll, we'll move on. Um, go oh, here, uh, oh sorry. Is decent, but Iron Fist makes my teeth hurt. <laughs> Dishrag, Punisher, which had a trailer drop the other day, with Metallica's one running the entire way through it, that trailer is special. It is 
absolutely awesome. I cannot wait for Punisher. And I'm a DC boy, and I never really liked Punisher as a character. I I am at half mast, <laughs> waiting for this waiting for this to drop. Excellent. That's okay. it. I'm done. Right, we'll move on to the final <laughs> segment of this part two of episode one, um, which is music. And I have something to mention. So uh, there's a, an upcoming artist in Australia called Lucy Neville, and she's a young Australian singer, songwriter, and musician from Sydney, Australia. Uh, she's released an album and singles in a solo career since 2015, um, but has just recently been signed to SAS Records. Uh, hey! She, yeah, she's been played on uh, local radio stations and can be heard on Spotify and Deezer or downloaded from iTunes, and she's got over 1 million plays on Spotify. She's got over 1 million plays on Spotify, so definitely worth your time. Um, and she's also been featured in magazines. Uh, you can find her website at lucyneville.com, and you find her on Twitter, Facebook, and YouTube, and Vivo as well. And why am I mention this? Because she's my brother's girlfriend, so it's kind of a duty. But, <laughs> but the um, oh mate, I could I could you know spruik my sister. <laughs> my my sister was on uh, the very first season of The Voice in Australia. Oh yeah, yeah yeah. I didn't even know. Admittedly, you had a she was. Yeah, yeah, she's she's younger, very talented, there very talented. So what happened yeah. to you? There you go. It's a very standard, what happened to me? Very I don't know. Thing to say. So I, I got know, I got some Jeez. samples to play, um, but yeah, she's she's we got her on the the girl. My daughter's absolutely love her as well. Between Lucy Neville and Sia, that is pretty much all that's played <laughs> in our house at the moment, and they they. Uh, they they're forever dancing around. I'm going to see if I can. So, "Fall at Your Feet" uh, was a signal, uh, a single she released last year, and it's actually a um, tropical take on the Crowded House version. Did the original? Oh, cool! Yeah, so I'm going to play a sample of "Fall at Your Feet" from Lucy Neville, which won't work because I've muted the the laptop. I'm trying new things here. I'm trying things that I've never done before. Nieces, please. <laughs> okay, please. Okay, please. Here we go. I'm gonna say, Crowdies. That 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 is a delicious version of a Crowdies song. Yeah, well, that's the thing because when you do um, covers of uh, previous songs, they generally don't work very well. And I don't like artists that do a direct copy. Um, and just, oh, absolutely. Lucy's made her own version of it, and I respect that of artists, which is why I wanted to um, play this. Is because when someone does a cover and makes it their own. That becomes something special. Um, I'm not going to name and shame other artists or anything, but you get those that just redo it for the sake of redoing it because it's a popular song and they're trying to get popularity from it. Uh, I don't, I don't, I don't dig that. That doesn't work for me. So that was uh, Lucy Neville, "Fall at Your Feet," and uh, this is her latest one, which is a bit different in flavour, and it's called "Waiting for You." This was released recently this year. I was waiting for you. So, yeah, there's, there's, she's got didn't, quite... Didn't hear much of the vocals in that one, Aki. No, I only wanted to keep it to a short clip. So, um, yeah. there is vocals in it. So, but, I mean, you can, get, you can find Lucy Neville, um, L-U-S-Y, obviously, for Lucy. Neville, spell N-E-V-I-L-L-E. -L -L -E, and you can go and um, you can go and find her on Spotify. She's got over one million plays on Spotify. No, she's, not, she, she's doing well, and she's up and coming. Just been signed. Uh, and she's played on radio stations in Australia. So you will 
you will be seeing more of her. Um, so you can go, go and offer your support, lucyneville.com. You can find her on our website. And uh, she's, she's a really, really nice person. And I, I, I mean that because I, I know her, obviously. So it's, she is a really nice person and she deserves her support. And, um, yeah, like I say, my girls love her. It's all we get played. Her and Sia are the only artists we have yeah. played. So, so guys, I'm, I'm, I'm going to just say one very simple thing to understand why I appreciate that Crowded House cover so much. That's, that's Australian rock right there. The original version of that song is Australian rock and it's that version does it so much justice I'm really impressed with that hmm. yeah good uh, she's a singer songwriter so she writes all her own music as well um, talented good. on all the instruments piano guitar um, so uh, yeah all Shane just what you said in the chat uh, th- th- she covers quite a lot of well dep- obviously it depends on the genre but she uh, those two, which are most uh, recent releases, um, they they are quite different from some of her album stuff as well. So go and check her out because uh, she she covers quite a, a spectrum of not genres, but um, uh, she has a lot of different feels to her music, and she writes all her own songs. Obviously, apart from the Crowded House, but she did her own version of that, and it is a very good version. So, has anyone got anyone else got anything to add to music before we wrap up this part? Look, mate, I, I think you've no, hit the nail on the head with just the one. Okay, excellent. Because you've, you've got samples, and if we've got something to hit up next time, we might hit you up with samples too. Yeah, man, that's cool. Okay, right, we'll close out this section then. This has been part two of the pilot episode, the music, film, and TV. We'll take a short break. We'll be back with part three soon, uh, which will be science and technology, and we are going to be covering the Cassini mission as a majority of this. And plus, we've got our new section, which I'm very excited for. That's not Science Digi. And I can't wait for this. <laughs> so, folks, we'll be, we'll be back shortly, and uh, we'll start, and, and then we'll kick off our new section. <laughs> 